Well, it's good to see you today. We are starting a new sermon series, nine weeks in the book of Colossians. And I'm really excited about it. I'm excited about the, uh, we spent 10 weeks with David over the summer. And what we saw was you really can sort of build something. And so I'm excited that you're here for that. We're going to start in Colossians 1, verse 1 together. And uh, if you're here for nine weeks, you're going to hit every verse. And more importantly, I think you're going to walk away with a, a renewed sense, a greater sense of what God has done for us in Christ. And that is why we gather week in and week out. Uh, The church has decided throughout the history of the last 2,000 years that it matters that people get together and celebrate the resurrection once a week. Not just because it keeps that belief going, but it keeps it going in us. It keeps it going in people like us. So we're going to share in Holy Communion uh, at the end of the service, which is our way of celebrating God's power in the ultimate sense and also how it affects us. Uh, So uh, we we come to celebrate. It is a weekly celebration of the goodness of God. And I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here for such a time as this, for uh, this time in the life of our church. And uh, as we start Rhythm today with our youth in the other room, a lot going on. In fact, we had Discovery Weekend in this very space over Friday and Saturday. And um, that is with our sixth graders, mostly sixth and seventh graders coming into the youth group. Uh, several years ago, we before we did this, we were, you know, you sort of have kids come in into the youth group and they're little and then there are a lot of big people and there are a lot of them. And so like those kids would walk in this room and they would go stand on that uh, wall and hope it would be over soon or somebody wouldn't eat them, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and now we have, <clears throat> you see those older students come around, those younger students, and they are imparting the, the love of God. Those are the whales, by the way. That's why they're doing that, I think. Um, they're, 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 they're mentoring them, they're loving on them, they're encouraging them, they're making friendships with them. And our hope is, uh, after the weekend, those sixth graders say, I'm so glad I get to go to Rhythm the next day, and that's uh, hopefully what's happening right now. And then we have Messy Games next week, uh, part of just the ramping up back of our student ministry, and we celebrate that. Uh, we celebrate a lot of things that God's, God is doing with us. And at, in that spirit of that it matters that we're a community, uh, we'll celebrate at the end of the sermon, uh, looking at over the summer. Sometimes I feel like in the summer, like maybe what happened, and then you start listing all the things, and it is a celebration of God's abundance and God's goodness with us. And so that's where we'll end, and then we'll go to communion. I also want to mention the, uh, the wildfires in Hawaii. Uh, woke up this morning to a notification off the Weather Channel app that said this is the deadliest wild, wildfire in the United States in 100 years. And I got a call this week from one of our members who has, um, who has a connection to Lahaina. Uh, and it's a very, it's a wild story. Um, this, this gentleman is a member of our church, moved here to Bowling Green from Mumfordville, but was a leader in the Mumfordville United Methodist Church, which burned to the ground um, 20 some odd years ago. And he was a leader helping rebuild that. But in the midst of that, right after the fire, five days later, he went to Hawaii, had a trip plan, and the church said, go ahead. And they went to the Lahaina United Methodist Church. And they, they sort of, you know, it's one of those churches where the guests have to stand up and tell where they're from and all that, which we don't do here. <clears throat> Thank God. <clears throat> uh, but they, they had them stand up and, and the gentleman got emotional and said, my church just burned to the ground. And the Lahaina United Methodist Church people came around them. They prayed over them in the service. And then someone came up after the service and handed him a $1,000 check. I mean, it just was like a story of God's goodness. So he called me to say, these people that came around us when we had a fire have now had a fire and their church has burned to the ground. And so it gives a kind of a, a, a personal connection to those folks. And we want to pray for them this morning. But if you want to give, as we discovered during the tornadoes, that you can give directly to churches that, that are, you know, trustworthy sources, a United Methodist Church, our brothers and sisters in Hawaii. And that's how you can give. That's, um, that is, I checked before they made the Facebook post. This was the way you always give to their church. And um, they made a, a post. If you want to give, you can give directly to them, L-U-M-C Maui. Um, uh, dot org slash donate is, is, is there's a dot org in there L-U-M-C Maui dot org slash donate or you can go to their Facebook page and you can get that uh, so uh, it is a reminder that it does matter that there's a community of people uh, gathered in Lahaina Ho- Maui Hawaii um, rehoming people finding spots one, one of their other their Facebook posts was we have people who need a place 
to stay. If you have a place, let's make those connections. We discovered that in, in the time of the tornado as well. There are just a, a million ways that we uh, don't know when we're going to need to be ready for whatever is needed. As we face life's challenges and as we face life's possibilities. And we gather Sunday after Sunday to speak to both. It is both, isn't it? Like overcoming and meeting life's challenges, but also not letting that sort of become like the, the burden that, that blinds us from the fuller possibility that we might have the life that God has and the life that God offers. And that's really behind the book of Colossians that I want to get to today. Uh, but first, a story. So a few weeks ago, our staff went on a staff outing. We don't do this super often, but sometimes we'll do like a retreat or something. Sounds very spiritual. We thought the most spiritual thing that we could do together was go play top golf uh, a couple Tuesdays ago. And it not be really about competition. You know, you keep score, and um, there's a score, um, but it's not really, you know, it's more like just, you know, a friendly kind of game. Like, you shouldn't mention, like, who, who got the highest score, right? Because that doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. It, it's just really not important. It was just like being together, um, and it's not always about winning. Uh, I have to remind people all the time uh, that it's not about winning. Anyway, so we're going in, church staff, we're ready to go. We walk in, and we're a little early, and there's a lady greeting who's, uh, who's there kind of when you walk in the front door is literally the perfect person for this job. Never met a stranger, very energetic, African-American lady, looks like maybe this is her retirement job. She is happy to be there. She's happy that we're there, and we got to talking. And, you know, it, we were a little early, as I said, so there was plenty of time. So she starts asking questions. And I don't, I don't lead with, hey, we're a church staff. We're glad to be here kind of thing. But she asked. And I said, well, actually, we're, we're on the staff of a church. And she instantly, like her energy was high already. It went to the next level. And uh, she started talking about how important it was that we come together. Uh, she mentioned how important it is that there are other people in the world out there praying. And then she began to talk about how the world is a scary place. And uh, so I began to like, so I've had this conversation before. It happens a lot. I began to peg her. She is an African-American Southern Baptist woman. This is kind of the, the picture I had in my head. And um, she was talking, I was sort of making an assumption, and she was uh, talking about how we needed to come together and unite around, how, again, how scary the world can be and how there need to be people praying about that. And I don't disagree with that, but I sort of felt like maybe that was going in a certain direction that I don't always go and, uh, you know, sort of like an anxious place. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you watch the news and you feel that anxiety. She's not wrong, but in my assumptions, I began to listen to her. She said, uh, not that... I am a nominal Christian anymore. And I thought, okay, I really know where this is going now. Nominal meaning sort of half-hearted, right? Not that I'm a nominal Christian anymore. In fact, I've been a Buddhist since 84. I did not expect that. <laughs> totally. Then I was the one who was like, okay, I need to know. You gotta, I need to know more now. And of course, Buddhists don't ground their lives in Christ. But they also don't buy, bound, uh, ground their lives in anxiety about the world either, by the way. Uh, so uh, maybe, should that, maybe that's just a cultural thing. And I just got like, oh, okay, I have a ton of questions. In a very odd conversation, the Buddhist part was totally unexpected. But the rest of it is a little bit in keeping with probably how we all feel about the world we live in. We, this conversation happens a lot. That we need to be motivated to act because of something we should be anxious about or fearful of or out of a sense that there's something missing. Now, the trick in this is that there's always something to be anxious about. There's always something that we are afraid of, and there's always a sense that the world is not as it should be. You know, someone has said it's not just that the world isn't like it uh, isn't right. It's that it's, we have a sense that it's not as it should be, and I think that's all true. But as I think about how we actually meet those anxieties, how we actually meet those causes of fear, and how we ultimately speak to the scarcity of our world, I think there, there might be another approach that's more, well, more honest about how things really are because of God's work in Christ and also more effective. A different way of coming at this to actually... To, to gather around. Yes, we do need to come together. But more foundational than the anxiety or the fear or the sense of lack is something else. 
And that's why we're going through Colossians, because Colossians is the most beautiful description of the sufficiency of Christ. And it makes the argument that you can kind of structure the world in lots of different ways, but the, the best way, the most foundational and true way is to see that God has acted in Christ and that's enough, and then everything else flows out of that. Now, Colossians is great, and it's beautiful because it's so descriptive, and it can be like, woo, way up there. You're going to see this in the next nine weeks. It can, go like, it can go to like the creation before the world began. It can go in the most the ultimate sense, the universe, all things everywhere, heaven and earth and everything in between. It can get cosmic, but it also this keeps coming back to the ground and saying, so what? What does that mean for you and, 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 and me? And so I've coined a phrase that I want to introduce to you today as we look at the book of Colossians that grounds, kind of helps you get a handle on everything that's said. So if you need the short version and you can only pay attention in short little bits, pay attention to this and see, and I want this phrase to kind of stick with you. Uh, Colossians is a, a beautiful description of the cosmic enoughness of Christ. Cosmic enoughness. That sounds like something made up, doesn't it? But hopefully, as we go along, you will see what I mean by that. And yet at the same time, it, that sounds like big, kind of like mysterious, what do you do with that? Uh, Colossians keeps coming back down to the ground and saying, this is our hope for you. This is what we want for you. And, it, and, and that's why we're here, because it describes what I think God wants for us. Uh, people who might not fully live into the cosmic enoughness of Jesus for lots of reasons. And we'll talk together about why the, the letter was written in the first place and what the concern was behind it. And, um, and, and really, in, in, in short, in, in summary there, I think there is just a sense that maybe these people who, who are getting the letter will have a good dose of Christ, but maybe trying to figure out where Jesus fits in their, their ways of thinking and in the world uh, that they live in, they might miss out on the fuller thing. And if I'm honest, that's probably my concern. Uh, and really the concern of the Methodist movement is that uh, we'll have enough of Jesus. Someone said it's sort of like a vac Jesus vaccine. You get enough of Jesus to be inoculated, but not enough to get a full-blown case. John Wesley was concerned that he would be sort of a half-hearted, nominal Christian. And instead of becoming a Buddhist, he uh, instead uh, just, just kept seeking uh, the fuller thing that he felt like God was offering in Christ until he felt like he discovered that. And that's why we've chosen this letter for us. Uh, Colossians gives us a beautiful description of what God is for, for us. And some of us were raised in traditions where it was very clear what God was against, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking about what God was for. In fact, uh, Colossians does a good job of just keeping uh, the focus on Christ and keep bringing that before us be rather than anything else. And so this is what I've said about Colossians, again, sort of setting this up. Colossians is concerned about two things, and they're related. It's concerned about the absolute sufficiency of Christ and the ultimate inadequacy of anything else. And so there were other ways of thinking that are, we, we think maybe as we read the letter that we don't know for sure, but other ways of thinking that were creeping in. And, and so Colossians is just a beautiful description of the enoughness, the cosmic enoughness of Jesus and the ultimate inadequacy of, every, of everything else. And we're going to talk about that. All right, so let's start. Uh, where should we start? Verse 1, uh, beginning. Very good place to start. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. This is sort of the Batman and Robin of the New Testament, right? You've got Paul and his trusty sidekick, Timothy. And uh, there are several letters in the New Testament that are this. They are letters written to a group of people. And so you always ask the question, who wrote it? And who are they, who's getting the letter? And we begin to wrestle with those questions together as we open the book of Colossians. There are several letters in the Old Testament where scholars look at it and say, that is absolutely Paul. And we, we know that Paul wrote that. There are other letters that scholars aren't as sure. And part of what makes this tricky, it sounds almost scandalous to us. There, were, there was a tradition in the ancient world to write in the name of someone else, to sort of carry on their tradition. So we don't know for sure. And this is one of the letters that we're not completely positive about. Did Paul write this with his own hand? Or was it someone writing and carrying on the tradition of Paul? 
And that, I bring that up because uh, it, it, that kind of sometimes will trick people up. It feels like we're sort of negating Scripture by saying, well, it says Paul, so why isn't it Paul? Well, that's just the, the way letters worked uh, in, in the ancient world. And, uh, it, and, and, and also, this has been handed down to us in the tradition of Paul. So we're, to make it easy, I'm, after having said that, I'm not going to kind of bring that up every time I talk about who wrote it. Um, but it draws on the story of Paul. We're going to talk about Paul. Uh, but it helps us understand what is also true of ancient scripture, which is sometimes it's hard to know the full story. And this is the way I think about it. When um, This is another story. So my grandpa passed away at the age of 93 in 2011. I grew up on the farm with my grandpa. And over the years, I began to discover that there were things about him that I didn't know. My grandpa had been in World War II. Uh, when I graduated high school, I lived with him for, during the summer, and I was going through some pictures, and I found a picture of uh, a concentration camp being liberated. Uh, and I said, Grandpa, what's this? And he goes, oh, yeah, um, I, I was there to help liberate a concentration camp. I'm thinking, like, could you have mentioned this, maybe? Like... What else don't I know about you? Uh, and, and that was, you know, that's sort of that generation and, and certainly, the, you know, the greatest generation. He just came home from war and worked on the farm, raised dairy cattle and milk cows twice a day. And that was, you know, that went on with life. Uh, and then when my grandpa died in, in uh, 2011, we were going through some of those pictures. I wanted to find those pictures and some others and thinking, what else don't I know? And we came across a box, opened it up thinking it was pictures and it was letters it was letters from my grandpa to my grandma in World War II. And here again, the same thing. Like you start reading things and it's like, how did I not know this? Or it was just like even more than just anything in particular, just like a window into their lives. My grandpa had, my grandma had, had Parkinson's for 10 years and my grandpa had never left her side. And I knew them as older and uh, married. They were married for over 50 years. And would have been married a long time, except she died in 1989. But here was a picture of them as a, as a young couple, like separated by war and separated by continents. It was just like, I don't know how to describe it, the most priceless gift. It sort of helped make sense of my own life and the world that I had been raised in and connected so many dots. And at the same time, it raised more questions. What Grandpa didn't do was give us every single detail about Europe and World War II. Of course, he couldn't, right? He didn't tell all the important details about liberating concentration camps and being part of D-Day. It was more about them, and that relationship was at the heart of those letters. And the New Testament is like this. We sort of have this thing that answers some questions and raises others and is this thing that we can cherish, uh, and we should cherish, like those letters that I held in my hand that day. So we're now to verse 2. Two, God's holy, who's this written to? To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. So Colossae, what do we know about it? Not a ton. Uh, and part of it is that it hasn't really been excavated like other places. There aren't a ton of pictures, but the pictures we have will show you how kind of unassuming this place is. There you go. Um, in fact, uh, it, is, it looks like there's going to be some excavation. I'm not an expert on this, but uh, just, just doing a little reading. But the issue has been it's been under somebody's farm. Uh, and so, you know, they're going to have to stop farming it to be able to dig up the city. And this kind of actually is part of the story because we, we really feel like Colossae was not a very big place. It was not a very happening place by the time of Paul. It was probably at one point. But, you know, some of the other letters that we have from the New Testament, like, First and Second Corinthians are written to a thriving metropolis with lots of issues. Uh, this is written to probably about 20 people in a church in the middle of nowhere. Now, my first kind of thought on that was like, well, that's really kind of depressing. But then as you think about it, it actually makes the whole thing even more impressive and more, more awe-inspiring that you have in maybe the New Testament, one of the most beautiful descriptions of the cosmic enoughness of Jesus written to 20 people in the middle of nowhere. And the assumption behind it is that it mattered that those 20 people got it. It's one thing to talk about how Jesus is enough. It's another thing for that to be embodied and the lived reality of people. The assumption behind the book of Colossians is that it matters that 20 people in the middle of nowhere got the sufficiency of Christ. So what does that say to people like us? 
What does it think, say about the hope and the possibility of a group of people like us in a, in a, I would say, a pretty happening place? I don't think Bowling Green's pretty happening. And a group of people, there are more than 20 of us, a group of people who would, would understand, grasp, and live in the fullness of Christ. I think it matters. And this is what God is for. And so in verse 9, we're going to skip a few verses because what you read in between is sort of like you would read it, and if I encourage you to do so, sort of like, hey, it seems like things are going pretty well for them. So, you know, back to like the other letters, like 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, it's very clear there are tons of problems. And Paul is like almost listing out, you're going to have to like, like reorient your life. You're not getting it. You're going to have to repent. You're going to need, you need forgiveness but Colossians doesn't seem so much about forgiveness. It seems more about fullness. The danger, I think, being that they would get enough of Jesus that they might live into following him, but not a full-blown case in which his grace transforms their lives. So Colossians 1.9, Paul, Paul writes, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we haven't stopped praying for you. You hear that? What we hear is that relationship I, I mentioned like between my grandma and grandpa. For this reason, we, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you. There it is. And you're going to hear fill and fullness over and over and over again. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. What did I just say? The assumption is that it matters that people get it, that, that you would know it, and that it would affect how you, how you live so that some things begin to happen in your life. And in Colossians 1.10 begins with that phrase, so that. So you, you know, it's a transitional phrase, right? It means that we've said something, and now we're getting to something. Uh, and so all of those are written from Paul to the church uh, as you, so that you will fill in the blank. But I changed the word so that we could claim it together, and we could read those words together. So verses 10 through 13, I've just taken the you's and made them we's, and we're going to say those together. So let's put that on the screen. And the, so that we're going to get the so that part of what Paul is hoping for these folks and for us. Let's read together. So that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience, careful what you pray for, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In that list of things that God wants for us, strength, endurance, patience, gratitude, joy, and then it says bearing fruit, you know, like fruitfulness, spiritual flourishing. The book of Colossians is about spiritual flourishing. When some of us were raised to know what God is against, we need to spend some time knowing what God is for, what the cosmic enoughness of Jesus is about. And it is about people knowing it so much that it becomes their lived reality. Colossians is concerned about two things, that you would know that. And that you would also know that there's nothing else that will do it. That nothing else that gets us there. And so today we set out our series with that expectation. The goal is for you to thrive spiritually. With the understanding that, that none of us get the fullness, the full story. That we need to take some time and just marinate in that cosmic enoughness of Jesus so that we might flourish, so that our lives might be characterized by strength and endurance and patience and gratitude and joy and fruitfulness, and that it matters that 20 people in the ancient world got it, and it still matters today that we would get it. And there's a phrase that captures all of that in 127, which we'll get to in a couple weeks, which is this. It sort of raises the expectations. It says, to them God has chosen to make known, so there's that knowing again among people like us, the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery, cosmic enoughness, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It comes right back down to the ground. This is not Christ sometimes available to you when you need to get through something tough. 
This is not Christ at a distance who did something at one point and now you are on your own. This is not Christ of scarcity who wants fear and anxiety to be your main motivator. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory through you. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems to raise the bar a bit, doesn't it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. But my, my guess is this is the very thing that we are longing for. The sense that we have, part of the sense that we have that the world isn't as it should be. And the thing that God needs to do in us is the thing that actually God is doing in us. The expectation is that Christ's life, so wrapped up in yours, that the fullness of God, the utter sufficiency of God, is your lived reality. Christ all around us, so that we no longer drive our, our actions because of lack or scarcity, but out of the abundance of that goodness. Not just that God's done it, but that we believe it and begin to act like it's true. And so there's an old prayer that captures this, which we'll be using at the end of the, the service um, each week. And we're going to, I'm going to introduce it now, and then we'll come back and say it together at the end of the service in our benediction. That is the prayer of St. Patrick, a sense of the comprehensiveness of Jesus. So this ancient prayer that goes like this, we go into the week ahead. Or we've adapted it, by the way. We go into the week ahead with, uh, with Christ, Christ with us, Christ before us. Christ behind us, Christ in us, Christ beneath us, Christ above us. You get where this is going, right? Christ on our right, Christ on our left, just in case we're not getting it fully. Christ when we lie down, Christ when we sit down, Christ in the eye that sees us, Christ in the ear that hears us, Christ in you, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And as I mentioned, we're going to do communion each week because we feel like if you're going to talk about it, then we get to live into that fullness of that story. We're invited week in and week out to a story in which death itself is overcome, which is not only about forgiveness, but also about fullness. And it is a celebration of God's goodness in community because it does seem to matter that a group of people gather on a random Sunday and say Jesus is enough. That somehow still matters to us and also to our world. And at Broadway, we think it does matter. We know that we know God's goodness and we live it out. Our words, uh, if you look in the back of the room, are invite, grow, serve. Those are the words that drive us. It speaks to the wide open welcome of God. It speaks to the transforming power of Christ. And it speaks to the power of service, reorienting our lives towards serving others. And I mentioned earlier in the service, I admit sometimes I forget all the ways that's happening. You go through the summer and you're like, oh, what did we do? And we've been scattered in lots of different directions. And then we started making the list. And so we made just a short, fun video that captures some of that fullness, some of that abundance, some of that love and community that we have shared together. And hopefully you see some life in it. I think you will. Let's watch.
through life.